Chapter 19, Part 4 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 19, Part 4 Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology. Jesus could not prophesy to the disciples the parousia of the Son of Man without pointing them, at the same time, to the pre-eschatological events which must first occur. He must open to them a part of the secret of the kingdom of God, viz., the nearness of the harvest, that they might not be taken by surprise and caused to doubt by these events. Thus, this discourse is historical as a whole and down to the smallest detail precisely because, according to the view of modern theology, it must be judged unhistorical. It is, in fact, full of eschatological dogma. Jesus had no need to instruct the disciples as to what they were to teach, for they had only to utter a cry. But concerning the events which should supervene, it was necessary that he should give them information. Therefore, the discourse does not consist of instruction, but of predictions of sufferings and of the parousia. That being so, we may judge with what right the modern psychological theology dismisses the great Matthean discourses offhand as mere composite structures. Just let anyone try to show how the evangelist, when he was racking his brains over the task of making a discourse at the sending forth of the disciples, half by the method of piecing it together out of traditional sayings and primitive theology, and half by inventing it, lighted on the curious idea of making Jesus speak entirely of inopportune and unpractical matters, and of then going on to provide the evidence that they never happened. The foretelling of the sufferings that belong to the eschatological distress is part and parcel of the preaching of the approach of the kingdom of God, and embodies the secret of the kingdom. It is for that reason that the thought of suffering appears at the end of the Beatitudes, and in the closing petition of the Lord's Prayer. For the pyrosmos, which is there in view, is not an individual psychological temptation, but the general eschatological time of tribulation, from which God is besought to exempt those who pray so earnestly for the coming of the kingdom, and not to expose them to that tribulation by way of putting them to the test. There followed neither the sufferings, nor the outpouring of the Spirit, nor the parousia of the Son of Man. The disciples returned safe and sound, and full of a proud satisfaction. For one promise had been realized, the power which had been given them over the demons. But from the moment when they rejoined him, all his thoughts and efforts were devoted to getting rid of the people in order to be alone with them. From Mark chapter 6, verses 30-33. through 33. Previously, during their absence, he had, almost in open speech, taught the multitude concerning the Baptist, concerning that which was to precede the coming of the kingdom, and concerning the judgment which should come upon the impenitent, even upon whole towns of them, from Matthew chapter 11, verses 20-24. through 24. Because, in spite of the miracles which they had witnessed, they had not recognized the day of grace and diligently used it for repentance. At the same time, he rejoined before them over all those whom God had enlightened that they might see what was going forward, and had called them to his side, from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. And now, suddenly, the moment the disciples return, his one thought is to get away from the people. They, however, follow him and overtake him on the shores of the lake. He puts the Jordan between himself and them by crossing to Bethsaida. They also came to Bethsaida. He returns to Capernaum. They do the same. Since in Galilee it is impossible for him to be alone, and he absolutely must be alone, he slips away to the north. Once more, modern theology was right. He really does flee, not, however, from hostile scribes, but from the people who dog his footsteps in order to await in his company the appearing of the kingdom of God and of the Son of Man, to await it in vain. Footnote. With what right does modern critical theology tear apart even the discourse in Matthew chapter 11, 
in order to make the cry of jubilation into the cry with which jesus saluted the return of his disciples and to find lodgment for their woes upon chorazin and bethsaida somewhere else in an appropriately gloomy context is not all this apparently disconnected material held together by an inner bond of connection the secret of the kingdom of god which is imminently impending over jesus and the people or is jesus expected to preach like one who has a thesis to maintain and seeks about for the most logical arrangement does not a certain lack of orderly connection belong to the very idea of prophetic speech End footnote. in strauss's first life of jesus the question is thrown out whether in view of matthew chapter ten verse twenty three jesus did not think of his parousia as a transformation which should take place during his lifetime Gilani bases his work on this possibility as on an established historical fact dalman takes this hypothesis to be the necessary correlative of the interpretation of the self-designation son of man on the basis of daniel and the apocalypses if jesus he argues designated himself in this futuristic sense as the son of man who comes from heaven he must have assumed that he would first be transported thither Quote, a man who had died or been rapt away from the earth might perhaps be brought into the world again in this way or one who had never been on earth might so descend thither Close quote. but as this conception of transformation and removal seems to dalman untenable in the case of jesus he treats it as a reductio ad absurdum of the eschatological interpretation of the title but why if jesus as a man walking in a natural body upon earth predicts to his disciples the parousia of the son of man in the immediate future with the secret conviction that he himself was to be revealed as the son of man he must have made precisely this assumption that he would first be supernaturally removed and transformed he thought of himself as any one must who believes in the immediate coming of the last things as living in two different conditions the present and the future condition into which he is to be transferred at the coming of the new supernatural world we learn later that the disciples on the way up to jerusalem were entirely possessed by the thought of what they should be when this transformation took place they contend as to who shall have the highest position from mark chapter eleven verse thirty three james and john wished jesus to promise them in advance the thrones on his right hand and on his left from mark chapter ten verses thirty five through thirty seven he moreover does not rebuke them for indulging such thoughts but only tells them how much in the present age of service humiliation and suffering is necessary to constitute a claim to such places in the future age and that it does not in the last resort belong to him to allot the places on his left and on his right but they shall be given to those for whom they are prepared therefore perhaps not to any of his disciples from mark chapter ten verse forty at this point therefore the knowledge and will of jesus are thwarted and limited by the predestinarianism which is bound up with eschatology it is quite mistaken however to speak as modern theology does of the service he required as belonging to the new ethic of the kingdom of god there is for jesus no ethic of the kingdom of god for in the kingdom of god all natural relationships even for example the distinction of sex from mark chapter twelve verses twenty five and twenty six are abolished temptation and sin no longer exist all is rain a rain which has gradations jesus speaks of the least in the kingdom of god according as it has been determined in each individual case from all eternity and according as each by his self-humiliation and refusal to rule in the present age has proved his fitness for bearing rule in the future kingdom for the loftier stations however it is necessary to have proved oneself in persecution and suffering accordingly jesus asks the sons of zebedee whether since they claim these thrones on his right hand and on his left 
they feel themselves strong enough to drink of his cup and be baptized with his baptism from mark chapter 10 verse 38 to serve to humble oneself to incur persecution and death belong to the ethic of the interim just as much as does penitence they are indeed only a higher form of penitence a vivid eschatological expectation is therefore impossible to conceive apart from the idea of a metamorphosis the resurrection is only a special case of this metamorphosis the form in which the new condition of things is realized in the case of those who are already dead the resurrection the metamorphosis and the parousia of the son of man take place simultaneously and are one and the same act footnote if therefore jesus at a later point predicted to his disciples his resurrection he means by that not a single isolated act but a complex occurrence consisting of his metamorphosis translation to heaven and parousia as the son of man and with this is associated the general eschatological resurrection of the dead it is therefore one and the same thing whether he speaks of his resurrection or of his coming on the clouds of heaven End footnote. it is therefore quite indifferent whether a man loses his life shortly before the parousia in order to find his life if that is what is ordained for him that signifies only that he will undergo the eschatological metamorphosis with the dead instead of with the living the pauline eschatology recognizes both conceptions side by side in such a way however that the resurrection is subordinated to the metamorphosis he says in first corinthians chapter fifteen verse fifty one and following behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed the apostle himself desires to be one of those who live to experience the metamorphosis and to be clothed with a heavenly mode of existence from second corinthians chapter five verse one and following the metamorphosis however and the resurrection are for those who are in christ connected with a being caught up into the clouds of heaven from first thessalonians chapter four verse fifteen and following therefore paul also makes one and the same event of the metamorphosis resurrection and translation in seeking clues to the eschatology of jesus scholars have passed over the eschatology which lies closest to it that of paul but why is it not identical with that of jesus at least in so far that both are jewish eschatology did not Rimerus long ago declare that the eschatology of the primitive Christian community was identical with the Jewish, and only went beyond it in claiming a definite knowledge on a single point which was unessential to the nature and course of the expected events, in knowing, that is, who the Son of Man should be? That Christians drew no distinction between their eschatology and the Jewish is evident from the whole character of the earlier apocalyptic literature, and not least from the apocalypse of john after all what alteration did the belief that jesus was the son of man who was to be revealed make in the general scheme of the course of apocalyptic events from the rabbinic literature little help is to be derived towards the understanding of the world of thought in which jesus lived and his view of his own person the latest researches may be said to have made that clear a few moral maxims a few halting parables that is all that can be produced in the way of parallels even the conception which is there suggested of the hidden coming and the work of the messiah is of little importance we find the same ideas in the mouth of trypho in justin's dialogue and that makes their jewish character doubtful that jesus of nazareth knew himself to be the son of man who was to be revealed is for us the great fact of his self-consciousness which is not to be further explained whether there had been any kind of preparation for it in contemporary theology or not the self-consciousness of jesus cannot in fact be illustrated or explained 
all that can be explained is the eschatological view in which the man who possessed that self-consciousness saw reflected in advance the coming events both those of a more general character and those which especially related to himself footnote the title of baldensperger's book the self-consciousness of jesus in the light of the messianic hopes of his times really contains a promise which is impossible of fulfillment the contemporary messianic hopes can only explain the hopes of jesus so far as they correspond thereto not his view of his own person in which he is absolutely original End footnote. the eschatology of jesus can therefore only be interpreted by the aid of the curiously intermittent jewish apocalyptic literature of the period between daniel and the bar kokhba rising what else indeed are the synoptic gospels the pauline letters the christian apocalypses than products of jewish apocalyptic belonging moreover to its greatest and most flourishing period historically regarded the baptist jesus and paul are simply the culminating manifestations of jewish apocalyptic thought the usual representation is the exact converse of the truth writers describe jewish eschatology in order to illustrate the ideas of jesus but what is this jewish eschatology after all it is an eschatology with a great gap in it because the culminating period with the documents which relate to it has been left out the true historian will describe the eschatology of the baptist of jesus and of paul in order to explain jewish eschatology it is nothing less than a misfortune for the science of new testament theology that no real attempt has hitherto been made to write the history of jewish eschatology as it really was that is with the inclusion of the baptist of jesus and of paul all this has had to be said in order to justify the apparently self-evident assertion that mark matthew and paul are the best sources for the jewish eschatology of the time of jesus they represent a phase which even in detail is self-explanatory of that jewish apocalyptic hope which manifested itself from time to time we are therefore justified in first reconstructing the jewish apocalyptic of the time independently out of these documents that is to say in bringing the details of the discourses of jesus into an eschatological system and then on the basis of this system endeavoring to explain the apparently disconnected events in the history of his public life the lines of connection which run backwards towards the psalms of solomon enoch and daniel and forwards towards the apocalypses of baruch and enoch are extremely important for the understanding of certain general conceptions on the other hand it is impossible to overemphasize the uniqueness of the point of view from which the eschatology of the time of the baptist of jesus and of paul presents itself to us in the first place men feel themselves so close to the coming events that they only see what lies nearest to them the imaginative development of detail entirely ceases in the second place it appears to us as though seen so to speak from within passed through the medium of powerful minds like those of the baptist and jesus that is why it is so great and simple on the other hand a certain complication arises from the fact that it now intersects actual history all these are original features of it which are not found in the jewish apocalyptic writings of the preceding and following periods and that is why these documents give us so little help in regard to the characteristic detail of the eschatology of jesus and his contemporaries a further point to be noticed is that the eschatology of the time of jesus shows the influence of the eschatology of the ancient prophets in a way which is not paralleled either before or after compare the synoptic eschatology with that of the psalms of solomon in place of the legal righteousness which since the return from the exile had formed the link of connection between the present and the future we find the prophetic ethic the demand for a general repentance even in the case of the baptist in the apocalypses of baruch and ezra we see especially in the theological character of the latter the persistent traces of this ethical deepening of apocalyptic but even in individual conceptions the apocalyptic of the baptist 
and of the period which he introduces, reaches back to the eschatology of the prophetic writings. The pouring forth of the Spirit and the figure of Elias, who comes again to earth, play a great role in it. The difficulty is, indeed, consciously felt of combining the two eschatologies and bringing the prophetic within the Danielic. How, it is asked, can the son of David be at the same time the Danielic son of man Messiah, at once David's son and David's Lord? It is inadequate to speak of a synthesis of the two eschatologies. What has happened is nothing less than the remolding, the elevation of the Daniel Enoch apocalyptic by the spirit and conceptions belonging to the ancient prophetic hope. A great simplification and deepening of eschatology begins to show itself even in the Psalms of Solomon. The conception of righteousness which the writer applies is, in spite of its legal aspect, of an ethical, prophetic character. It is an eschatology associated with great historical events, the eschatology of a Phariseeism which is fighting for a cause, and has therefore a certain inward greatness. Footnote. The fact that in the Psalms of Solomon the Messiah is designated by the ancient prophetic name of the Son of David is significant of the rising influence of the ancient prophetic literature. This designation has nothing whatever to do with a political ideal of a kingly Messiah. This Davidic king and his kingdom are, in their character and the manner of their coming, every whit as supernatural as the Son of Man and his coming. The same historical fact was read into both Daniel and the prophets. End footnote. Between the Psalms of Solomon and the appearance of the Baptist, there lies the decadence of Phariseeism. At this point, there suddenly appears an eschatological movement detached from Phariseeism, which was declining into an external legalism, a movement resting on a basis of its own, and thoroughly penetrated with the spirit of the ancient prophets. The ultimate differentia of this eschatology is that it was not, like the other apocalyptic movements, called into existence by historical events. The apocalypse of Daniel was called forth by the religious oppression of Antiochus, the Psalms of Solomon by the civil strife at Jerusalem, and the first appearance of the Roman power under Pompey, fourth Ezra and Baruch by the destruction of Jerusalem. Footnotes Enoch is an offshoot of the Danielic apocalyptic writings. The earliest portion, the apocalypse of the ten weeks, is independent of Daniel and of contemporary origin. The similitudes, which, with their description of the judgment of the Son of Man, are so important in connection with the thoughts of Jesus, may be placed in 80 to 70 B.C. They do not presuppose the taking of Jerusalem by Pompeii. The Psalms of Solomon are therefore a decade later than the similitudes. The Apocalypse of Baruch seems to have been composed not very long after the fall of Jerusalem. Fourth Ezra is twenty to thirty years later. The Psalms of Solomon form the last document of Jewish eschatology before the coming of the Baptist. For almost a hundred years, from 60 B.C. until A.D. 30, we have no information regarding eschatological movements. And do the Psalms of Solomon really point to a deep eschatological movement at the time of the taking of Jerusalem by Pompeii? Hardly, I think. It is to be noticed in studying the times of Jesus that the surrounding circumstances have no eschatological character. The fall of Jerusalem marks the next turning point in the history of the apocalyptic hope, as Baruch and 4th Ezra show. End footnotes. On the contrary, the indifference shown by the Roman administration towards the movement proves that the Romans knew nothing of a condition of great and general messianic excitement among the Jewish people. The conduct of the Pharisaic party also, and the indifference of the great mass of the people, show that there can have been no question at that time of a national movement. What is really remarkable about this wave of apocalyptic enthusiasm is the fact that it was called forth not by external events, but solely by the appearance of two great personalities, and subsides with their disappearance, without leaving among the people generally any trace, except a feeling of hatred towards the new sect. 
the baptist and jesus are not therefore born upon the current of a general eschatological movement the period offers no events calculated to give an impulse to eschatological enthusiasm they themselves set the times in motion by acting by creating eschatological facts it is this mighty creative force which constitutes the difficulty in grasping historically the eschatology of jesus and the baptist instead of literary artifice speaking out of a distant imaginary past there now enter into the field of eschatology men living acting men it was the only time when that ever happened in jewish eschatology there is silence all around the baptist appears and cries repent for the kingdom of god is at hand soon after that comes jesus and in the knowledge that he is the coming son of man lays hold of the wheel of the world to set it moving on the last revolution which is to bring all ordinary history to a close it refuses to turn and he throws himself upon it then it does turn and crushes him instead of bringing in the eschatological conditions he has destroyed them the wheel rolls onward and the mangled body of the one immeasurably great man who was strong enough to think of himself as the spiritual ruler of mankind and to bend history to his purpose is hanging upon it still that is his victory and his reign these considerations regarding the distinctive character of the synoptic eschatology were necessary in order to explain the significance of the sending forth of the disciples and the discourse which jesus uttered upon that occasion jesus's purpose is to set in motion the eschatological development of history to let loose the final woes the confusion and strife from which shall issue the parousia and so to introduce the supramundane phase of the eschatological drama that is his task for which he has authority here below that is why he says in the same discourse think not that i am come to send peace on the earth i am not come to send peace but a sword from matthew chapter ten verse thirty four it was with a view to this initial movement that he chose his disciples they are not his helpers in the work of teaching we never see them in that capacity and he did not prepare them to carry on that work after his death the very fact that he chooses just twelve shows that it is a dogmatic idea which he has in mind he chooses them as those who are destined to hurl the firebrand into the world and are afterwards as those who have been the comrades of the unrecognized messiah before he came to his kingdom to be associates in ruling and judging it footnote jesus promises them expressly that at the appearing of the son of man they shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel from matthew chapter nineteen verse twenty eight it is to their part in the judgment that belong also the authority to bind and to loose which he entrusts to them first to peter personally from matthew chapter sixteen verse nineteen and afterwards to all the twelve from matthew chapter eighteen verse eighteen in such a way too that their present decisions will be somehow or other binding at the judgment or does the upon earth refer only to the fact that the messianic last judgment will be held on earth i give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven from matthew chapter sixteen verse nineteen why should these words not be historical is it because in the same context jesus speaks of the church which he will found upon the rock discipleship but if one has once got a clear idea from paul second clement the epistle to the hebrews and the shepherd of hermas what the pre-existing church was which was to appear in the last times it will no longer appear impossible that jesus might have spoken of the church against which the gates of hell shall not prevail of course if the passage is given an uneschatological reference to the church as we know it it loses all real meaning and becomes a treasure trove to the roman catholic exegete and a terror to the protestant End footnote. End of chapter nineteen part four